the topic, chapter three is stoichiometry. That's kind of a fancy word uh, for counting, keeping track of things in chemistry. Um, there's some things in chemistry that you don't have to apply numbers or measures to. Right? Those are qualitative observations. But some things uh, are best done in a qualitative, uh, quantitative fashion. That is, fix numbers to them. And stoichiometry is one of those. Stoichiometry takes account of the quantities of material that go into a reaction and are able then to predict how much of the product will come out after the reaction. And of course, um, that comes in two flavors. One is the theoretical, that is if the reaction is 100% efficient, then you can predict how much you should get. Uh, but chemical reactions are rarely 100% efficient. So, um, we also introduce correction factors for the um, efficiency of a reaction. But we're going to look at stoichiometry in chapter three. And uh, this is just a little historical background. It's, it's neither here nor there, and, it's, uh, and uh, it's not something you need to memorize either. Just for those of you who are interested, uh, originated with a German chemist, uh, Jeremiah Benjamin Richter. Okay, so if we're going to count things, if we're going to keep track of everything, we need a way to, um, now that we know that reactions are dependent upon atoms and how they interact, bond with one another, break bonds, reform bonds, then we need to, we need to figure a way to count the number of atoms in a convenient form. Um, the, it's, it would be impossible for us to count every atom in a reaction. So we need a more convenient way. And we look to history for that. Uh, originally, when reactions were being studied, uh, even alchemists would um, have their recipes set up in terms usually of weights, weights of measures of their reactants that they put together. <clears throat> and modern chemists started off that way. They knew how much by weight something, a reactant would go in and maybe with another reactant of a different weight amount and produce a certain product weight. And that was good enough for a while, but that became a problem. And I'll talk about that later, hopefully. But <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna count the number of atoms or molecules, whatever the case may be, uh, by weighing them. And this is something of an approximation. Um, approximation can be um, wildly in error or uh, under certain circumstances it can be very accurate. So we need to understand how the process is done. Um, so in order to do that, and because the atoms are too small to count and um, we have to assume that all the objects that we're counting beho behave as if they were identical. And in order to do the counting, we need to know the average mass of each of the objects. If we know the mass of each object, then if we have a certain total mass, we can use that information to convert the total mass into the number of objects. And that comes under the heading of a dimensional analysis. Okay. So here's an example. Say you have a pile of marbles and you 
put them on a balance and find out that the pile weighs 394.80 grams. Um, but you don't know yet how many there are. You know there are a lot. So what do you do? You take a sample of the marbles, count the number of the sample, which is easier to do, and then you find the mass of those 10 marbles. Turns out that it, they're 37.60 grams in this example. And the question is, now with that information, can you calculate the number of marbles in the pile? Uh, the answer is yes. We just find the average mass of each marble, right? So if you count 10 of them, then each one is going to be 3.76 grams per marble. And uh, I like to do it this way. If you have uh, 394.80 grams, you want a conversion factor that will convert grams into marbles, numbers of marbles. And the ratio has to have grams on the bottom and marbles on the top, right? Because if you multiply this times that, grams must cancel because you don't want grams in your answer. You want marbles in your answer. And the ratio then is 3.76 grams per marble. Okay. And it turns out that that's 105 marbles. So that's how we count by weighing. Now, in this case, it was simple, right? We could pick out and count the number of marbles and weigh them. Uh, for atoms, it's a little more difficult. It's trickier because we can't actually count the number of atoms. Well, now we can, but when this method was first developed, <laughs> we, we couldn't. So how do we count the number of atoms in a pile? Right. The way we do it is we pick a standard mass for one element and one atom from that element and one isotope of that atom. Right. We talked about isotopes before. Remember they have same number of protons, different number of neutrons. But in order to use mass, we have to have one isotope of that element. Uh, carbon-12 is our standard. Right? And carbon-12 is exactly 12 atomic mass units. Right? So we just set that as our standard and everything else is compared to it. Um, we also need to use Avogadro's law so that we know that we're comparing equal numbers of atoms. In other words, if we're going to compare that mass of carbon to a mass of something else, we need to know that we have exactly the same number of carbon atoms here that we've taken a mass of in, in grams. And then compare that to the exact same number of atoms over here to a different element. And the only way we can know that is by using Avogadro's law. All right, so there's your standard. Um, this author uses just a simple U for atomic mass units. So don't let that throw you. So um, atoms in nature occur as a mixture of isotopes, right? Even carbon, the most common, you know, 90 some odd percent is 12, uh, carbon 12 with six protons and six neutrons. But there also is a significant 
contribution made by carbon-13, which is a stable isotope. It doesn't decay. So the average mass of carbon in nature is 12.01 atomic mass units. That's if you don't separate the isotopes from one another. And all elements are like that. Every element has a mixture of isotopes. So in this case, carbon is almost 99% uh, carbon-12 atomic mass units. And uh, carbon-13 is about a little over 1%. Carbon-14 is less than, we don't count that one because first of all, it's such a small amount. Well, we don't count it. <clears throat> People who do this for a living count everything. But carbon-14 is radioactive. So the sample you take today won't be the same sample tomorrow. <clears throat> so in order to get the uh, average atomic mass unit, we use a, um, a weighted average, kind of like calculating your grade point average, right? Uh, isn't it better if you make an A or a 4.0 in a course that's worth three credit hours? than it is in one that's worth one credit hour, right? That, that three credit hour makes that A in that course more valuable, it's heavier. So we take a weighted average of carbon, 98.89% uh, of 12, which is, use the fractional value here, 0.9889 times 12, and 0 0.0111, which is 1.11% of the other one. And notice this one is not exactly 13 because it's compared to the standard. And compared to the standard, it's a little more than 13 units. But when you take the average of those, the weighted average of those values, uh, you end up with, uh, rounded off to two decimal places, I should say, 12.01 atomic mass units for the average mass of carbon in nature. Okay, let me see. I'm thinking we missed something in here somehow. Avogadro's law. We haven't talked about Avogadro's law yet um, because uh, we have to discuss gases to get to Avogadro's law. But if I'm gonna use the, if I'm gonna reference Avogadro's law, I ought at least define it, if not go into a lot of detail. So I'm gonna give you the short version. Avogadro said, he was an Italian scientist in, um, let's see, late 18th, early 19th century. He said that if you have two volumes that are exactly equal, right, equal volumes, and you put a gas in them, any kind of gas, and you maintain the temperature of each exactly the same, and you make sure the pressure in the vessel of each is exactly the same as the pressure. All these are equal to one another, side to side, temperature, volume, pressure. Then the number of gas molecules in this one are exactly equal to the number of gas molecules in that one. Now we have a way of comparing masses because now under these conditions, as long as your compound is a gas or your element is a gas, then you know that you have exactly the same number of particles in there, same number of atoms or molecules. So if you weigh them, then you know the difference is due to 
a difference in the weight of each individual atom. That's Avogadro's law. Now, of course, uh, we've since expanded uh, to take advantage of Avogadro's law and expand it to liquids and solids, which you would have to do really in order to uh, take advantage of the counting by weighing concept. But that's where it got started. And I'll probably do that again when we get to the chapter on gases. <clears throat> okay, so now we've determined the average the average atomic mass for uh, carbon in nature uh, is 12.01. Now, does that mean that we can ever find a single atom that has that mass, 12.01 atomic mass units? No, uh, we, we couldn't find one like that uh, any more than we could find um, uh, your average grade point average to be on 3.6. I mean, where are you going to go for it? You might by coincidence find it in a course, but um, it's unlikely because we have to report grades in whole numbers. Like I have to report either a four, a three, a two, so forth. I can't do a fraction at this school. Some schools let you do that, but not this one. Um, so that's our weighted average. So what does that allow us to do? That allows us to take a sample from nature, weigh it, and relate that weight directly to the number of atoms that that weight represents. Because now we have an average mass for each atom, just like we did with marbles. Okay, so how do we know uh, carbon is 98.9 or 89 percent carbon 12 and the rest uh, carbon 13. Well, we use a, an expensive, <laughs> uh, difficult to operate instrument called a smack, a mass spectrograph, a mass spectrometer actually. And this is a, an example of one type. There are several different technologies that do the same thing but this is probably the oldest uh, and still used mass spectrometer type. Your sample goes in here, uh, you vaporize it. You have to make it into a gas and then you ionize it here with an electron beam. And then you um, accelerate it through these negative plates. So you've got a positive electrode over here somewhere, a negative one here, and the electric field accelerates your ions through these um, plates. Now, why do we have two of them? Well, if you try to form a straight line or a straight beam of anything, light or particles, it doesn't matter. If you only have one plate and your source is here, you could come out like that, right, through one plate, right? It could come out and it'll be narrower, but it won't be straight. So what you do is you put another one over here and you line it up perfectly with that other one. And the only, the only particles in this case that can get through those ions as the ones that are going straight to begin with. Now you have what they call a collimated beam. Okay, and it's going really fast. So now you pass that beam uh, between two magnets. And you know that any charged particle that goes through a magnetic field will bend. And that's what they do. Uh, they, all the ions experience the same magnetic field. So why do they bend differently? Well, the same force is applied to each one based upon its charge. And if they're all the same charge, then the only difference among the ions is their mass. 
So the heavy ones don't bend as much because the force uh, isn't sufficient to deflect a heavy ion. And it's more, it will deflect a light ion more easily. So that's what happens. The heavy ones land out here, the light ones end up over here. And with today's fast electronics, you can count the number of impacts on your detector. And each impact is a separate ion. So you can actually count how many ions impact uh, relative to the others. And you can get a ratio. That's how we know that carbon is 98.89 and 1.11 is, is carbon 13. And you do that with any elements. Okay. So let's say we have, um, let's see, I'm talking too long, I think. Yeah. An element consists of 62.6% .6 of an isotope with this atomic mass unit and 37.4% of an isotope with this mass unit. That's it. That's both of them. That's all of them for that element. What's the average atomic mass? Well, you just take this number. Let me see. Let me draw a little bit. You take this number and convert it into a fraction. 0 0.6160. 0 0.61, excuse me, 0 0.6260 times 186.956. And you get a number. That's the contribution of that isotope to the total. And then you take 0 0.3740 times 184.953 and multiply that. And then you add those two values together. And that's the average atomic mass for this element. So what is it after you do that? Well, Come on. Oh, okay. I get it. There we go. <laughs> so there's our multiplication. And there's the answer. That's the average atomic mass for this element with that isotope composition. Now, what's the element? Well, um, your periodic table has in each one of these squares, not just the symbol for the element, but it also has, in this case, in the upper left-hand corner, is the value, atomic mass units, in this case. It's also something else, but I'll talk about that later. And uh, they increase from upper left to lower right. So top to bottom, left to right, Increasing values of mass, just like atomic numbers or whole numbers, same way, atomic mass also changes like that. So if you follow that 186.2 and you go along and you say, you look up here, you follow it, okay, it's too much, got to go back to this one, 186.2 turns out to be rhenium, R-E, capital R, little e, which is, that's not one you had to memorize, but... That's what it is. Okay. So um, the atomic number, the number of protons, does definitively tell you the element if you know the number of protons. If you don't know the number of protons uh, and you have the atomic mass, the average atomic mass, you can usually figure it out from the periodic table too. There are only a couple places in here where the atomic masses of neighboring elements are so close together that experimental error might throw you off. You might guess the wrong one, but that's rare. Okay, uh, I forgot to, let me erase that. Let's see, these tools are, are really clunky. I don't know why I bother with them. The mole. The mole is our expression for numbers of atoms, numbers of ions, numbers of molecules. In fact, the mole is just a number. It's a number of things. 
it's based upon the number of atoms, right? But it doesn't have to be. I mean, it could be chickens for all we care, except chickens won't do our chemical reactions much good. But it is a number of things, and it's the expression for how many that you have. By definition, the mole is the number of carbon atoms in exactly 12 grams of the isotope carbon 12, right? By definition. And now we know that number. Uh, and for our purposes, this is plenty accurate. Is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And you put out here whatever you want, atoms, ions, molecules, whatever the case may be. It's still one mole of whatever it is you identify. Uh, that is affectionately known as Avogadro's number. Now, he didn't calculate it, but the work that he did and was carried on after his death was responsible for identifying that exact number. Okay. So, if you take a, a sample of pure carbon from nature, how much will a mole weigh? In fact, a mole of carbon atoms from nature weighs 12.01 grams, right? So that value in each one of these squares right here, that value is, uh, can mean one of two things. It can mean atomic mass units for individual atoms, or it can mean the mass in grams of one mole of those atoms that naturally occurring, one mole, okay? Which is the way we typically use it. It's more valuable that way, grams per mole, than it is atomic mass, mass units per atom. Okay? So if we want to calculate the number of iron atoms in 4.48 moles of iron, how do you do that? Dimensional analysis. 4.48 moles, and we abbreviate mole with, as M-O-L, we just drop the E. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, right? 4.48 mole, or plural, and we want how many, how many uh, atoms is that? Okay. So we need a conversion factor that will cancel the moles and give us atoms. And there's your conversion factor. One mole, this is atoms, equals one mole. Remember, every conversion factor starts life as an equality. Okay, moles cancel, leaves you with atoms. So when you multiply those two together, right, you get 2.70 times 10 to the 24th iron atoms. And all you had to do was know how many moles there were. Well, how do you find out how many moles there were? You generally weigh your sample and convert it to moles first, and then convert to moles to atoms. But typically, um, this is an exercise for, of understanding. I want you to understand what they mean. Um, when we're actually doing stoichiometry, we stop at moles, grams and moles. Those re that relationship is the important center to our universe. So how about nitrogen? What does nitrogen weigh for each mole? Well, you should look on your periodic table right here. 
it says 14.0067. And I typically round it off to two decimal points. So if I'm rounding off the, to the hundreds place, I look to the right and find that's a six. So the hundreds place is rounded up to one. So it's a 14.01 grams per mole. And you can get that from the periodic table. How about water? How do we do water? As it turns out, the molar masses are additive. If you have one mole of water, how many moles of hydrogen do you have? You have two. So it's two moles times the molar mass of hydrogen. And you only have one oxygen, so it's one times the molar mass of oxygen, add them together, and that is the molar mass of one mole of water, right? One mole of that unit is based upon two moles of hydrogen and two moles of oxygen. Okay, so that's how we do it, right? There's the hydrogen. I generally round it to 1.01, .01, and 16 is a good round for oxygen. So you add them together, round them off, 18.02 grams per mole for water. What about a more complex uh, compound? Here we have barium. How many nitrogens do we have? We can look up barium. Uh, barium is 137.33 grams per mole. How about nitrogen? How many nitrogens do you have? Well, this is a polyatomic ion, remember. So that means we have a parentheses around it and we need two of them because nitrate is a minus one charge and barium is an alkaline earth with a two plus charge. So we need two of them. So two nitrogens is two times 14.01. How many oxygens? Well, three times two is six. We have six oxygens. So six times 16 is the contribution from oxygen. Add them all up and you got 261.35 grams per mole of that formula unit, that compound. I just noticed this needs to be subscript. Let me make a note of that. And where is it? There it is. Subscript that thing. Okay. Which of the following is closest to the average mass of one atom of copper? Remember, what, read what it says, one atom of copper. So you could look up copper here, find out how much a mole weighs. It's 63.55 grams per mole, right? So if we chose this one, we'd be wrong because we don't have a mole, we only have one atom. So what would you do? You would divide that by Avogadro's number to find out how much one atom weighs, right? And test taking technique, none of these make any sense. No atom is gonna weigh that many grams, right? So <laughs> this is the only possibility in a multiple choice environment. But that's what the calculation looks like. We find out um, for one atom, how many moles does that represent? And then we multiply that by the molar mass. Right? Make sure units cancel. And this is your answer. Uh, how many carbon atoms are there in 63.55 grams? Avogadro's number, of course, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd copper atoms in that many grams of copper. Now let's make it a little more complicated. Suppose you have 100 gram sample each of these elements, magnesium, zinc, and silver. 
100 grams each. Which one contains the largest number of atoms? Well, if they've got the same mass, but they're different elements, that means they have different masses per element, I mean, per atom. That means if you're going to make 100 grams of one of them versus the other, the lighter one is going to take the most number of atoms. Right? It's got to make up the difference because it, it's lighter. So you look for the lightest of the three. And it turns out magnesium has the smallest uh, molar mass, we call it. How much does it weigh per mole? molar mass. So magnesium is, is lighter than zinc and is lighter than silver. So it takes more atoms of magnesium to make 100 grams. Let's rank these according to the greatest to the least. All right. It's not as difficult as it looks. If you've got 107.9 grams of silver, 70 grams of zinc, and 21 grams of magnesium. You just want to put them in order, right? So what if we compare them to how much a, uh, a mole of each weighs, right? If we put the number of moles of each in order, that's the same as the number of atoms, isn't it? So let's find out what it is. 107.9 grams of silver. Is that greater than, less than, or equal to a mole? Let's see, silver, 107.9. It's exactly one mole. How about zinc? Let's see, zinc is... 65.39 to make one mole. So this one is greater than a mole. How about magnesium? Magnesium is 24.3 grams per mole, but we've only got 21, so it's less than a mole. Right? So greatest to least number of atoms. This would be in the middle, right? So greatest would be over here, least would be over here, and the least would be less than a mole, and the greatest would be more than a mole. So magnesium, silver, zinc is the order from least to most number of atoms. Wait a minute. Zinc is, oh, yeah, okay. This is <laughs> greatest to least. Okay, I put them backwards, didn't I? Greatest to least, zinc, silver, magnesium. All right. So let's say we have a 100 gram sample of each of the following. Rank them from greatest to least number of oxygen atoms. And that's why I say down here, it's time for Henry Ford, assembly line. So if we've got, uh, let's put them in order. Water. And dinitrogen monoxide. And C3H6O2 is probably propionic acid. C3H6O2 and carbon dioxide. Okay. Now, what I mean by assembly line is you do the same thing over and over and over again. So when we get to this step, we're going to repeat that step for each one. Okay. So, Greatest to least number of atoms, and you're starting with 100 grams. So you start with 100 grams. Okay. Okay. 
and we're headed for the number of oxygen atoms. But first we need to find out how many moles of each of the compounds there is. And then we can use a factor because they have different numbers of oxygens. That one's got one, that one's got one, that's two, and that's two. So we would use that factor at the end. So how many compound, I mean, how many moles of each compound do you have? All right, you need molar mass, grams on the bottom, moles on the top. Okay, what's the molar mass of water? We just calculated it, 18.02. Okay, that's the number of moles of the compound. How about N2O? We got two nitrogens at 14.01. Uh, and then we have to add an oxygen at 16. 4402. How about C3H6O2? We have carbon 12.01, remember that? But we need three of them. And then we need six hydrogens. Six times 1.01 .01 is 6.06. .06. Add that in. And two oxygens, two times 16 is 32. So that's 74.09. Okay, carbon dioxide. Carbon is 12.01, and two oxygens is 32. So that's 44.01. Okay, so now that gives us the number of moles of the compound. All right. How many moles of oxygen does that represent? Well, we've got another step in the Ford factory. Right? We have, uh, we want to cancel moles of compound. And replace it with oxygen moles. Okay, so what's the ratio? For every mole of the compound, you have one oxygen. For every mole of this compound, you have one oxygen. Here you have two oxygens for every one compound. And here you have two for every one. Now, that's the hard part. Next, you just crunch the numbers and compare them. So let's see, 100, 18.02, and then times one is 5.55 moles of oxygen. Uh, in 2 0 100. 44.02 and 1. So that's 2.27. And then 100, 74.09 and times 2 is 2.70. And the last one, 44.01 times two, 4.54. Okay, so we have to order, order them greatest to least number of oxygen atoms. So this is the greatest. 
next next and last so it should be water carbon dioxide propionic acid and ni dinitrogen monoxide okay and a lot of problems are best work that way especially when you have to do these comparisons when you set it up as an assembly line then you can watch each step and know that there are only certain changes that have to be made based on the compound. But the steps <coughs> are all the same. <coughs> right? Problem solving. What's the question? Do you have the information to get there? And then find the information if you need it, like periodic table, useful information tables that I give you, and then uh, check it. Does it make sense? Right? Does that make sense? Well, this one's a little harder to estimate. But very often you get a single number answer at the end and you say, does that make sense? I mean, is that real? Like if I've got a sample in my hand and I say it weighs 32 tons based on my calculations, <laughs> Uh, there's something wrong there. Metric tons, of course. All right. Let's see. Let's get all this stuff off of here before it sets in permanently. Okay. I need a different color. Let me see. Uh, how about green? Forest green. All right. <clears throat> um, one of the things that chemists do is when they're presented with a new compound, they want to know what's the composition of the compound. You know, how much is this element how much is that first they want to know what are the elements right so they do a qualitative analysis find out what all the elements are in that compound and then they do a more detailed analysis to find out how much of each one is in the sample and to ratio them and usually the, the expression comes out as so much mass percent of each one and that is the mass of the element divided by the total mass of the compound that's been sampled times 100. That's the mass percent of that element. Okay, why is that important? Well, um, you can go about this two different ways. I mentioned you can do the analysis, right? But you can also calculate the theoretical percent composition if you know the formula of the compound. In this case, we've got iron three oxide. Is that right? Iron three oxide? Well, we've got iron and we've got oxygen. Oxygen is always a two minus. So that's six minus that has to be neutralized. So if you've got two irons, each one has to be three plus to make six plus and neutralize six minuses. So yeah, it's written correctly. <clears throat> so how do you do it? Well, uh, you assume one mole of the compound, right? So one mole is represented by what? One mole of the compound means two moles of iron here. So that's the mass of the iron in a mole of the compound. And this is the mass of one mole of the total compound. We just did a calculation like that. This is the molar mass of the compound. And this is the contribution to that molar mass of the iron. And you just ratio the two. And you find out that um, 
iron percent is 69.94 percent. Right, you can do that for oxygen since there are only two elements, right? You just subtract that from 100 percent, and that should be what's left. Okay. Uh, let's see, three o'clock already. I might have to skip this one. Um, if we were to take the same four compounds that we had before and rank them by percent oxygen by mass, um, you would do that calculation, right? So much oxygen, molar mass of oxygen divided by the total molar mass times 100, that would give you the percent oxygen. And you would come up with a different ratio than the previous one. All right, this is what I'm really getting at. <clears throat> when a chemist does that analysis, that information can be used to give you the empirical formula. The empirical formula of a compound is the simplest whole number ratio of the elements in the compound. And I mean whole number ratio of atoms in the compound. So this empirical formula, CH, <clears throat> That ratio is one carbon for every one hydrogen. But we don't know what the molecule is like. We just know that that's the ratio of carbon to hydrogen atoms. It could be this one. All right? Or it could be this one. All right? And those two, two compounds are completely different. Um, this one is benzene and that one's acetylene, right? But they both have the same empirical formula. Now, if you know the percent composition by mass of your compound, that's as far as you can go right there. In order to determine whether it's this one or that one, <clears throat> you need one more piece of information. You need to do a determination of the molar mass of the compound. How much does a mole of the compound actually weigh? And there are several techniques that we use depending on whether the, uh, the uh, compound is uh, a volatile liquid that makes a gas. Right? We can do it one way. Um, is it soluble in water or soluble in some other solvent? We can use some colligative property that we haven't discussed yet, of course, uh, to determine the molar mass because colligative properties, it doesn't matter what the compound is. The, the uh, quantitative measure that you get out of it is moles of whatever you put into it, regardless of what it is. That's the nature of colligative properties. So once you know the empirical formula from the percent composition by mass, and then you augment that with the, with the uh, molar mass of the compound, then you can determine the uh, molecular formula, right? So I want to show you how to do that in the time we have remaining. Maybe, I think we have an extra day built in. So I could either finish this to the end or pick it up Wednesday. Uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, uh, this is just a, an apparatus that sometimes we use to determine the elemental composition, particularly of, of uh, hydrocarbons and carbohydrates, because we know that they only have, hydrocarbons only have carbon and hydrogen, and carbohydrates only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? So this device will allow us to determine those, those values. Now, if there's anything else, it requires a different uh, procedure to determine other elements. Okay. 
Uh, I'm not going to labor this point uh, right now. It's just to show you that I've done it before, right? I know how these things work. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take this example, right? Adipic acid. The composition of adipic acid is 49.3% carbon, 6.9% by mass of hydrogen, and 43.8% oxygen. We can use that to give us the empirical formula. And once we have that, then we can use the molar mass to determine the molecular formula. Right. So let's do that. Hmm, that was going to be hard to get off. Maybe I need to pick a different color. Let's go back to blue. <clears throat> so Henry Ford again. We've got 49.3% carbon. We have 6.9% hydrogen. And we've got 43.8% oxygen. Okay. What's our end game for this? To find out the atomic ratio, right? That's just mass. I mean, how do you get mass out of, and that's not even the, a, a, a number with dimensions, right? Percent is a dimensionless number. The only reason we know that it's uh, grams per hundred grams is because we said it was. But if you just see percent hanging out there by itself, it just means parts per hundred. It could be grams per hundred milliliters for all we know. But in this case, it's grams per hundred grams. But you can't use percent to determine moles of each one, right? Because molar mass requires that you have grams. So what do we do? Are we stuck? Well, no, not really, because this ratio is the same no matter what the, the total mass is. So let's say convenience. Let's say we have 100 grams of samples, of the sample. So it's 49.3 grams per 100 grams. That's what percent means. So now if we assume 100 gram sample, then we can say 49.3 grams of carbon and 6.9 grams of hydrogen and 43.8 grams of oxygen. Now, now we can convert to moles. Grams on the bottom, right? Because this is in the numerator, that has to be in the denominator. So for each mole, what do they weigh? Well, carbon is 12.01, isn't it? Hydrogen is 1.01. .01. Oxygen is 16. Okay. Now let's see what the, that's the mass ratio. Let's see what the mole ratio is. Numbers of atoms ratioed to one another. So. 49.3, 12.01 divided into that is 4.105. That's moles of carbon. Uh, 6.9, 1 1.01, 6.832. moles of hydrogen and oxygen, 43.8 and 16 divided into it, 2.738. Okay, are we done? Nope. <laughs>
because you don't write a chemical formula with fractional numbers of atoms, right? You've either got one atom there or no atom there or two atoms there or three atoms there. So, but this ratio is fixed. That ratio of moles of carbon to moles of hydrogen to mole of oxygen, we just need to convert it to whole numbers. So how do you do that? The simplest way is take the smallest number and divide everything through by that number. It's a mathematical process. If this is the ratio, then if we divide everything by the same number, it's still the same ratio. So the smallest one is this one. Right. Well, this is obvious. That's one <laughs> by definition. So 2.73a, 2.73a, divide that into 6.832 is 2. Point, well, let's round it off. Right. We're approximating now. Round it off. 2.5 and carbon 4.105 is 1.5. Now we're getting close. That one's a whole number, but these guys are fractions. How do you get rid of a fraction of 0 0.5 or one half? Multiply by two, don't you? Two times a half will be one. And then two times one will be two. And that makes two plus one is three. So if we multiply everything through by two, then we get two here, five there, and three there. So our empirical formula for a dipic acid is carbon three times, hydrogen five times, and oxygen two times. That's the simplest whole number ratio. Now we have to check ourselves, right? Can that be reduced any further? Is that, can it be simplified? Well, that's an odd, that's a prime, that's a prime, they're all prime numbers. <laughs> so you're not gonna get any, you can't divide them by each other or anything uh, smaller. So that's it. That's the simplest whole number ratio. All right, we got the empirical formula. Now we need to go for the molecular formula. So here's how you do that. Let's see, did I get that one right? Yeah. The molecular formula says that if this is the empirical formula, then it may have been uh, reduced from something larger by whole number multiples. So if we find out what that multiplier is, right? If it's one, then this is the formula. If it's two, then it's six, 10, and four. If it's three, it's nine, 15, and six. Well, how do we know? Well, this one, if it's one, how much does that weigh? What is the molar mass of that formula? And I call it the empirical mass. So what's the empirical mass for that well, it's three carbons and then five hydrogens and then two oxygens, 73.08 grams per mole. All right. So is that the same as the molar mass experimentally determined? No, 
The molar mass there is 146. All right. That's if this is one. What if it's two? Well, if it's two, it's 146.16. There you go, x is equal to two. And the formula now is C6H10O4. Okay, that's the logic behind using the empirical mass and the molar mass. Now, once you understand that, then you should realize that all you really have to do is determine the molar mass for the empirical formula or the empirical mass divided into the molar mass and the nearest whole number is your multiplier. All right. Uh, wait a minute. What am I doing? Three. Oh, I got 30 more minutes. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So that's how we do empirical formula, molecular formula. Here's our representation of a chemical reaction. Right, it's a it's our standard notation for writing a chemical reaction. You always write the reactants on the left-hand side, and they undergo a reaction signified by this arrow, and the products are on the right-hand side. <clears throat> we'll expand upon that later, uh, in later chapters. Um, and notice uh, characteristics here. We have this is the molecular formula of one of the reactants. This is the formula for another reactant. Notice it's oxygen O2, which means it's one of those diatomic elements, right, that I had you memorize off the table. And uh, notice in front of each one, one uh, several of these, there is what we call a coefficient. That number says, in order for this reaction to balance, right, in order to obey the law of conservation of mass, you need three of these oxygen units to go along with one of these ethanol units in order to produce two of these carbon dioxide units plus three of the water units, okay? That balances the equation and you can prove it by saying the total number of each element on this side is equal to the total number of each of its elements on the right-hand side. So two carbons here means you need two carbons there, right? Two times one is two. Hydrogen is five plus one is six. Three times two is six. Oxygen is one here and six here, which is seven. And here you have four oxygens. Two times two is four and three is seven. So you have the same number of each on both sides. It's balanced. Uh, okay. So let's go to the next one. Uh, like I said, the equation's balanced, and it's balanced because we have neither created nor destroyed individual atoms of each element. And you can look at it two different ways. You can say one molecule of this plus three molecules of O2 yields two molecules of carbon dioxide and three molecules of H2O. Or you can say one mole or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd 
atoms, uh, excuse me, molecules of ethanol reacted with three moles of oxygen yields two moles of carbon dioxide and three moles of water. Both are perfectly valid. The last one, the one where we use moles, is more useful. Especially when we're talking about stoichiometry. Now, under these conditions, with that number of reactants yielding products, we're saying that the reaction as written is theoretically 100% efficient. That is, everything that comes in on the left-hand side ends up on the right-hand side. No losses in between. So what do you do if you have an equation that doesn't balance? You look in there and you say, I've got so many carbons and on the reactant side, the product side is a different number. Well, you have to balance the equation. An unbalanced equation tells you nothing except the reactants and products, what goes in and what comes out. It doesn't tell you anything about the ratio and how to uh, quantify input and output. So, first thing you have to do, what is the reaction? What are the reactants? What are the products? And in many cases, you need to know the physical states involved. Is it liquid, solid, gas, or even aqueous solution? And we're gonna limit ourselves to those four categories. If your compound is a gas like this, and you write a little g after it. If it's a liquid like this, you put a little l after it. If it's a solid like, um, like that, you put an s after it. And if we put sodium chloride in solution, in aqueous solution, it's not a solid during the reaction, then we would write it like this. AQ for aqueous solution. Okay, those are the only ones that we're gonna deal with. Okay, <clears throat> now it says write the unbalanced equation. Well, in number one, first, you've gotta be sure that you wrote the compounds correctly. If it's a word problem, and it says um, ammonium phosphate reacts with. How do you write ammonium phosphate? Well, ammonium is a polyatomic ion. And so is phosphate. But that's not the formula. Ammonium is a plus one charge. Phosphate is a three minus charge. You've got to write it correctly, or that's the end of it. You can't go any farther, uh, further. So you would say you need three of those. And since it's a polyatomic ion, you have to surround it with parentheses. Then you can go. You got that one done. I mean, if there's another one, you got to write it correctly also. That's your first step. You write those compounds correctly. That's why I hammered that subject so hard in the beginning. Because if you can't write the compounds, uh, your ship is sunk. Then you write the unbalanced equation. You put the reactants on this side with a plus sign between each one, and then an arrow, and then the products, right? Most of the time, uh, if you're given a problem, you'll be told what the products are, reactants and products. There's one possibility, the one case uh, of reactant types where you can deduce the products. And I'll point that out when we get to them. Now, most textbooks tell you then to balance the equation by inspection. 
which is uh, a cop out. That's what we used to say way back in the 60s and 70s. What that means is they don't want to bother telling you how to do it. They just figure you figure it out. Right? All this other stuff I put in here, I deduced myself and found the best way I thought that students could learn how to balance equations. Uh, but one mm, law for balancing equations that's chiseled in stone is do not change the formulas of any of your reactants or products. Once they're written correctly, you never touch the formula. The only way that you can balance after that is with coefficients, the numbers in front of the formulas. Okay, these are some hints of how to uh, most efficiently balance an equation. And I put them in here just so that you'd have a permanent record. But um, uh, showing you how to do it is probably more efficient. So let's skip those and go to an example. Okay, so here's an example. And it looks to me like it's off center. It is, it's off center. Right? This equation, what I try to do is, oh no, no, it's okay. Excuse me. Everything's fine. Notice this red line down here. That separates reactants on this side, products on that side. Okay? And these are the elements or groups that we're going to balance. Now, here's one of the first tricks. For this equation, you've got ammonium phosphate, I put up here already, in aqueous solution and we're gonna react it with calcium chloride, and this one should be an aqueous solution also. That was left out inadvertently, which I should make a note and correct. Let's see. Uh, that would be aqueous also, okay? Uh, and the products written correctly are calcium phosphate, and ammonium chloride, and it's still in solution, but the calcium phosphate precipitated, which is a fancy word for these two solutions produced a solid, and you can tell the reaction has occurred um, when the solid forms. Okay, so the first trick, uh, this is a not balanced equation. So notice, that rather than putting individual atoms or elements down this left-hand side for our budget, I call it my balancing budget. If you have a polyatomic ion that's in the reactants and it shows up in the products unchanged, that is there's nitrogen here and nowhere else and there's nitrogen here and nowhere else, then you can uh, use that as a balancing group, ammonium. Ammonium here, ammonium there. It's perfectly legal to do that and more efficient to do that than to break it into individual elements if you don't have to. Phosphate's the same way. There's your phosphate. Here it is over here. There it is over there. No place else. It has not been broken apart. Calcium is separate, chlorine is separate, and you've counted for all of your groups or elements. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Got them all covered. Now what you do is you um, count, assess what's your starting point, what's your initial for each one of these, on the reactant side. Okay, so here you got three ammoniums, right there, three ammoniums with the subscript. You got one phosphate, there's one calcium, 
and two chlorines right there. Okay, that's the initial uh, accounting for your budget. How about the product side? Product size says you've got one ammonium, you've got two phosphates over here, you've got three calciums, and you've got one chlorine. Now, why are they different? Because they're different compounds. That's a different compound than this one or that one. So that gives you a, uh, an uneven starting point, right? You're starting off with three over here and you end up with one over there. We gotta fix it, right, with coefficients. So where do you start? Well, <clears throat> uh, one of the rules, one of the hints that I give you is you look at your equation and you say, are there any single elements as reactants or products? In this case, no. Why would I look for single elements? Because when you start changing numbers of atoms or groups, as you add coefficients, if you do that to a compound, then you're not just changing the one you want, you're changing the other one too. So if you've got an element in here, then you save it to last. Because when you add a coefficient to that one, you've only changed that one. And that may be all you need at the very end to bring everything into balance. So in this case, we don't need that because there are no elements. Okay, so where do you start? Well, uh, I would say it takes intuition, but when all else fails, just start at the top. Right? So if we change, uh, well, that's one right there. Well, no, excuse me, the numbered steps, that's step number one. If we say, all right, if I say put a three in front of this one, that says three calciums, right? And that will balance the three calciums on the other side, right? So that gives me, um, I started with one, now step one gives me three calciums for now, right? What's next? Well, you need to account for that change. Three calciums means now you have six chlorines. All right, so now you got six chlorines to deal with instead of two versus one. That may not be so bad, right? Don't panic yet. What's next? Well, next, let's balance the chlorines, right? We need six of them, so let's say six chlorines here also changes the number of ammoniums, right? So now we have six ammoniums and we have six chlorines, right? So let's see, let's look at ourselves. Six, the chlorines are balanced, the calciums are balanced, now the ammoniums and the phosphates are still out of whack. So what are we gonna do next? Let's balance the ammoniums on the left-hand side. We've got three here already. So if we make a coefficient of two, two times three means six ammoniums, and that will bring the ammoniums into balance. Okay, so we also have to account for the change that we made in the phosphates, right? Two times this propagates through the entire compound. So while this may be six ammoniums, it's two phosphates that we added. Okay. Now, what do we got? Let's check ourselves. Six, six on both sides, left and right. Two, two, three, three, six, six. We're balanced. Coefficients of two, three, one, and six balances our equation. Okay, I didn't get to show you all the tricks. Um, 
we might run out of time, so let's let's carry on. Uh, this is just making the point that the equation can be balanced with non-zero numbers or with extra large numbers. But what we try for the more correct, so to speak, <laughs> way is to use the smallest whole number ratio of coefficients. So if we find ourselves with uh, this one, right? Two, five, two, and one is the simplest whole number ratio. But we could also write that as four, 10, four, and two. Be the same ratio, but it's not what we prefer. We try to simplify it to the smallest whole numbers. Right? Any of those would be accurate, but it wouldn't be preferred. Now, sometimes when you're balancing an equation, uh, one of those tricks I, I was, let's see, let's go back. One of these, um, when you, you may need to make a fraction as a coefficient in order to balance the equation. And then once you've established the balance of coefficients from here to here, 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 then you get rid of the fraction, right? So if it happens to be a fraction with two in the denominator, you multiply the entire equation through by two, get rid of the fraction, and now your ratio hasn't changed, right? Just like an equation, a mathematical equation. If you multiply both sides by the same number, then you have not changed it, the, the meaning of the equation. And that's how you get around uh, roadblocks. Hopefully I'll be able to show you one or two. Okay, so let's get past this and go to the next one. Uh, this is just a, to check to see if you are paying attention. Let's see. Yeah, okay. We may have a convenient stopping place coming up. Um, so which of the following are true concerning balanced chemical equations? There could be more than one. The number of molecules is conserved. Is that true? Let's go back and look. Is the number of molecules conserved in this one? There's two plus five is seven. Seven molecules on this side. There's two plus one is three on this side. No, a balanced equation does not have to conserve the number of molecules, only the number of atoms of each element. The coefficients tell you how much mass of each substance you have. Never. The coefficients are a numbering system. They tell you how many units of the molecules or, or atoms that you have of each reactant and product. If you, and eventually we need to, to determine mass in and mass out, right? But you can't do it directly. I have to show you how to, to do that stoichiometry. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed. That is true. The coefficients indicate the mass ratios of the substance used. That's just another of, of uh, way of saying Roman numeral two. They're both false. Five, the sum of the coefficients on the reactant side equals the sum of the coefficients on the product side. No, that's another way of saying Roman numeral one. The number of molecules is conserved. Some of the coefficients is not the same on both sides, except by coincidence. Okay, so the only one that's true out of all these statements is we conserved the atoms on both sides of the equation. And I'm just hammering this point. Never, after you write the balanced compound to balance the equation, 
do not touch the subscripts. Right? You ought, you ought to be horse whipped if you do. Um, coefficients can be fractions, right? But we we prefer whole numbers. Um, later on, we might use um, maybe not in this course, but later on we can use fractions as coefficients, but for very special reasons. So we're not going to go there right now. For now, it's enough that you learn how to balance equations with simplest whole number ratios. Okay, we got five minutes left and we need to talk about stoichiometric calculations. So I think what we'll do, uh, let's see. Yeah, we need to take plenty of time to cover this topic. So let me make a note. We'll stop here, stoichiometric calculations right here and pick it up on the 10th, 2, 10, 21.